miraculous King. Fill this place with your amazing presence. Pour your power on us as we seek more of you. I believe. I believe in you and what you do in me. We're gonna go to the next part. In me. In me. We give you all of the glory. All right. We give you all of the I want to suggest that we switch anthem with, with, with swap the order, Steve. Well, creo en ti before anthem. And end the set with anthem. Yes, thank you.
Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. All right. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be here this morning. I'm excited to exalt the name of the Lord with you all. So I want to invite you to be a participant of everything that's going to happen in this room this morning. What am I asking you to do? All right. I want you to be a participant. So we're going to sing together. We're going to praise the Lord together. We're going to make some declarations together. We're going to pray together. BC, so good to see you again. BC was jamming last night with Expresión de Gloria. So good to have you here last night. We had a blast last night declaring the new life that we have in Christ. And we're just, today, this morning, is just a continuation of that celebration of the life that we have received. Uh, so we're going to bless his name. This, uh, King David said, bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Only a little bit that is within me. Part of what's within me. All that is within me. Praise his holy name. So let's do that together. I invite you to stand. I invite you to clap. I invite you to sing, pray, participate as God and the Spirit leads you this morning. Amen. All right. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Yes, God. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Do I walk through the wilderness? Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes. Blessed be your name, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be your name, when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all is I should be, blessed be your name, yes God. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Is in the offering. Blessed be your name. Yes, God. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Yes, God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, No, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Yes, God. And blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Yes, God. Blessed be your name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your 
your name you give and take away you give and take away my heart will choose to say blessed be your name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your name blessed be your name of the lord blessed be your glorious name i will extol the lord at all times his praise will always be on my lips I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Let me see the radiant people of the Lord this morning. Their faces are never covered in shame. This poor man, this poor person, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and he saved them out of all his troubles the angel of the lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them in the last verse i want to read taste and see come on taste and see that the lord is good blessed is the one who takes refuge in him blessed be the name of the lord blessed be the name of the lord somebody bless the lord this morning Amen. father we are here to declare your goodness, to bless your name. You have been so good. You have been so, so good. And we know, we know that you are standing on our behalf. We are never alone. You are fighting for us. So we are, we can declare the victory in any situation that we're facing because you are for us. Greater are you you who live in us, greater is he, greater is he in us. Hallelujah. We bless you today, Lord God. We bless you today. Anybody feeling victorious this morning? Hallelujah. 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 Yes. Hallelujah. Praise you, God. God is fighting for us. God is on our side. He has overcome. Yes, he has overcome. We will not be shaken. We will not be moved. Jesus, you are here. You're carrying our burdens covering our shame he has overcome yes he has overcome we will not be shaken we will not be moved jesus you are here i will live i will He has overcome, yes, he has overcome. We will not be shaken, we will not be moved. Jesus, you are here, yeah. and I will live. Will not die. The resurrection power of Christ alive in me, and I am free in Jesus' name. The resurrection power of Christ is alive in me, and I am free in Jesus' name. I will live. I will live. I will not die. I will declare and lift you high. 
Christ revealed, and I am real in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. I want to make this declaration. God is fighting for us, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, the enemy is defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting for us, pushing up the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, the enemy is defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. I say this, and God is fighting for us, pushing up the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, the enemy is defeated, and we will shout it out, shout it out. I will live, I will live, I will not die. Resurrection is alive in me, and I am free in Jesus' name. I will live, I will live, I will die, I will declare and lift you high. For oh, Christ revealed, and I am healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We're going to stay there for a minute. We're going to stay there for a minute. Because I feel, I feel that this is a very important declaration for us to make. I know it's important for me. Let me tell you something. Uh, when this song came out a long time ago, about 10 years ago, um, I was learning to live with HIV. So it was important for me to say, I will live and I will not die. And you may not have HIV or cancer or something like that, but we all face challenges. You don't know if leaving out of this building, what's going to happen. You don't know if eternity is meeting you today. I don't know if eternity is meeting me today, but I know that I'm going to live. I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So can we make this declaration today? We don't have to go in rhythm or anything like that, but it's important for us to say, as the prophet said, I will live and I will not die. I will live, I will not die. The resurrection power of Christ is alive in me and I am free in Jesus' name. Come on, say that again. I will live, I will, I will declare, I will declare and lift you Oh, Christ revealed, and I am healed in Jesus' name. We're going to say that again. I will live. I will live. I will not die. The resurrection power of Christ is alive in me, and I am free in Jesus' name. I will live. Come on, let me hear you. I will Christ revealed, and I am healed in Jesus' name. Yes, I will live, and I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, as King David said. I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. So here, here, say here. I'm going to see God's goodness here. I'm going to see God's goodness in FCCC. I'm going to see God's goodness in Ashburn. I'm going to see God's goodness in my house. I'm going to see my, God's goodness in my family. I'm going to see God's goodness in my children. And it's important for us to make these declarations and align ourselves with what God says about a matter. 
Because when we do, when we do, I promise you that we are aligning with life. Did you hear that? We are aligning with life. So align with life today as you make these declarations and declare that our God is holy, that he is good, and that he is present. Amen. Hallelujah. We stand in for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes, you are God. We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he? Can we see? Holy is the Lord God Almighty. We of the Lord is the We bow down worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He! And together we sing. Yes, in one voice, Amen. Everyone sing. Tell Him, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Yes, You are the Lord. Is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord. Is filled with his glory. The earth is filled with his glory. And it's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's real It's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's real It's all here together. And together we see.
you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We believe in you and what you're going to do in our lives. So today, we are choosing to give you the glory. Hallelujah. Gracias, Dios. We believe in you, God. We believe in you like a child believes in their father. Like a child trusts in their father. We show our trust by lifting our hands and raising our voice this morning, God. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. We bless you, God. I just want, I just want to lift my hands to you, Lord. You're a wonderful God, miraculous key. Fill, fill this place with your amazing presence. Pour, pour your power on us as we speak more of you. I just want. I just want to lift my hands to you, Lord. You're a wonderful God, miraculous King. Fill this place, fill this place with your amazing presence. Pour your power on us as we seek more of you. I believe in What you do is you say it again. I believe in you. I believe in you. And what you do in me, in me, in me, in me. So we.
somebody say that. And what you do in me. Yes, God, I believe in your promise. I believe in you. What you do. And what you do. Is there's nothing that we have achieved that we've done on our own. You've been present. You've kept your promise. And you will keep your promise. You have won the victory. So we give you the praise. You did it all for us. Thank you. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Stripes, we are healed by his nail peace and by his blood were washed clean. Now we have the Yeah. 
did it for me. You have all for me, and death could not hold you down. You are the risen king.
We bless you, God. We bless you, Lord. Thank you for what you did on Calvary for us. Help us to never forget and to always proclaim that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you put away your glory to hang on a cross. Creator of the universe, the one who put the stars in their place, clothed himself with humanity, slept in a manger, hung on a cross, was buried, all because he loved us. Father, help us to never forget. Help us to never forget the victory of the cross. Help us to always proclaim the victory of the cross. Father, help us not to get bored. Help us not to get bored with the life that you've given us so richly, Lord God. Forgive us, forgive us, Lord God, forgive us. Forgive us for forgetting. Forgive us for letting life drown out the resounding voice of your victory, presence of your victory. You are our king. Help us to never forget that you are the king seated on the throne. Help us to always give you the priority of sitting at the throne of our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. And anyone that agrees, say amen. Amen. Thank you, God. When we think of communion, we often think of juice and little biscuits of bread. I want to tell you a little different story of communion that I experienced yesterday. It didn't have to do with juice and bread. It had with, to do with the church being the church. Larry and I woke up about 6, 6.30 yesterday, and we had a stench of sewer in the house, and shortly after, Aaron comes up from the basement and says, there's water leaking in the basement. And I went down, and sure enough, there's water coming through underneath of our kitchen into his kitchen. And I sort of go, <sighs> you know those mornings. 
And I figure, okay, today is a day where I'm going to deal with something that I didn't expect. I start, fi- I start working things out in my mind and think, okay, everything's got to be torn out in order to get to the plumbing line that's in the wall because I know it's not the water feeds, it's got to be the sewer that feeds into the wall. And so I start tearing things out, and before long I think, I need some help. I can't do this by myself. And so it's about 7.30 in the morning, I text Steve K. And say, Steve, are you working today? If not, I can really use your help. Shortly thereafter, Steve um, called back and said, what's the problem? And I explained to him briefly what the problem was, and he said, I'll be over in about an hour. And He spent the next four hours or so helping me um, tear out the old pipe that had uh, about 12 holes that had rusted into the bottom of it that we cleared those holes the previous night when we had a when we had clogged pipes and we put pipe cleaner down it cleaned everything out that was keeping the pipe from leaking (laughs) and that's why we sprung the leak that communion between Steve and I was spent in the kitchen on the floor and down, down in the basement pulling pipe serving one another. Now I've got, I I owe them, so I'm going to be going over to his house. Tess has, Tess has a laundry list of things that she wants done outside, so I'm going to be having communion with them around that different table. You see, when we celebrate this cup, it's not just about celebrating Christ's death and resurrection. It's also about celebrating the communion that he brings us into as his body. Celebrating life together as a church. We do that not just when we drink bread and, or eat bread and drink juice. We do that when we lovingly give ourselves in service to one another. I want to thank Steve for being there for me yesterday and for us celebrating communion together in service. As we celebrate together, recognizing that it's not just about this moment, but it's about how we love one another in the body of Christ. We take this bread together. It is his body broken for us, and we take it in remembrance of him. And we drink of the cup of the covenant in his blood. God, we thank you not just for your death and your resurrection that brings us new life, but we thank you for the community that brings us together as the body of Christ. That communion is not just about a little celebration that we have on Sunday morning, but communion can be felt as we live in service with one another. In your son's name we pray, and the church said. He is risen. Amen. Never get tired of saying that. All right.
Let me share with you some things. Um, we have the usual things that I want to remind you of. We have the chances for us to get together and be in communion with each other, like Steve was talking about, and just in our study and our prayer times and the things that we do together. Uh, we have the Spanish-speaking Bible study today at 1.30 in the fireside room, like we do virtually every Sunday. And speaking of virtual, that we have the Sunday Connection Group at 1 p.m. Uh, on Zoom. We have the Wednesday morning Bible study. That's a study of Isaiah, 10.30 a.m., either in person here or on Zoom on Wednesday mornings. Thursday evening, he get the, also by Isaiah, which is 7 p.m. I think it's just Zoom, right, on Thursdays? Yes, okay. Um, Men's Connection is tonight at 6.30, Panera Bread and 106 and Cicero. So, guys, I'm looking for some guys to meet me there tonight and, and uh, talk about what we heard in the message today and what's going on. Uh, so, 6.30 for men today at Panera. The Daily Pair Groups, uh, which is a virtual meeting every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday morning at 7.30 and at 8. Refined for Women had their meeting yesterday. And so it'll be another four weeks until the same Saturday next month. Uh, and also the worship and prayer time last night, Spring to Life. We're doing that every month on the, every other month on the third Saturday. Or, okay, so it'll be two months for that next one. Uh, but, but if you have prayer requests, you can email them to office at firstchristianchicago.com. Or if you're watching this on Zoom or on YouTube, I mean. Uh, and you want to know more about us, email office at firstchristianchicago.com. If you're interested in donating and you didn't give a chance to do it in person, tre the email for that in cell is treasurer at firstchristianchicago.com. We're still doing the care package for new arrivals. The red bin out here for that. And uh, a couple other things. Uh, I think the, the message went out this week about faith promise. We're going to revamp what we're doing with missions. So anyone that's interested in being part of our discussion about what missions we support and how we do that, uh, please let Steve know that you're interested in being part of that discussion. Also, uh, you know, we mentioned a couple weeks ago that we got the sound all working better with the speakers. And we still have an issue with the microphones. You notice today that one of the microphones cutting out, it's because they change frequencies on us and somebody else is using that frequency now, these microphones are, I don't know, 15 years old maybe. And so uh, we really need to get some new microphones that are digital that will not have that kind of problem. So we're asking for a special offering if you are interested in donating to that. I think if I remember right, Steve, it was like $1,700 for the microphones just to get a couple. And also, uh, like two, two wireless and a headset, I think it was, or three. And another 5,000 or so if we want to go digital on the board, which we really would prefer to do, uh, because that board's getting old as well. So we really could spend about 7,000 or so on getting the rest of the sound equipment. Uh, so if you are interested in helping with that, please make a special offering uh, over and above what you normally give and designate that for the sound system. Let's see, I think I've covered things. If you are, yeah, I think I've covered everything. Did I miss anything? Okay. Then I think it's time to go into our prayer time. So for the prayer time, get together with a couple people, share with each other what are you celebrating, what are your challenges. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll, mo I'll meet you at the Zoom link that should be shared in the chat. Uh, so what are you celebrating, and what are your challenges? And let's spend a little minute in prayer for each other.
God, we thank you for this time of fellowship, of sharing, of being the church, of uh, gathering together in prayer and letting our hearts be poured out for one another as we pray together with one another. God, we thank you that in that we find community. We find you. We hear from you. We experience your grace and your love as we pray for and with one another. God, uh, we pray your blessing on the prayers that were were spoken in the different groups. We we thank you for the celebrations that were offered. And God, we we ask for your power and your presence to be felt in those places where we have been troubled. We ask for your mercy to be exhibited. And we ask that your church rise up and help in those areas where we can be your hands and your feet to accomplish your purpose. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Over the last week, we have been taking a tour of the ancient Near East. Um, During our tour, we discovered the things which the nations have placed their trust in. We discussed military might, we discussed the allegiances, we discussed resources, the religions, wisdom, you know, the intelligence that we have, those v- the various different things, and how we place our trust in those things, and how every one of those things in which we place our trust cannot save us, but will lead us to dis- uh, destruction and disaster. This week, we're, we're going to take another tour. This one, it's, again, it's going to be a tour of the ancient Near East. Some places will be familiar because we visited them last week. Other places will be an out-of-the-way corners that we haven't yet visited. We might look at the differences between last week's tour and this week's tour this way. When people visit Chicago that they normally do the tourist thing. They stop at Michigan Avenue, they visit the theater district, the Navy Pier, they go to the beach, they visit one of the zoos, the museum campus. If they can fit it in, they'll, get tic- they'll try to get tickets to one of the sports arenas, one of the sports venues in Chicago. They might do an architectural tour or a river tour by boat, and they very well could make some pilgrimage. And while doing a visit, a tour of Chicago, it doesn't really bring you, though, into contact with the true nature of the city. In order to discover the character of Chicago, you'd have to leave the tourists' locations and take part in a 77 neighborhood tour. In this tour, you would get off of the beaten path. You would be guided to the best restaurants known only to the locals in a given neighborhood. You would witness the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sometimes, some things would would take your breath away in amazement. Others would rob you of your breath in fear. While last week we spoke of the things that nations value or trusted, our tour tour this week will display to us the character of the nations, like the differing flavor of Chicago neighborhoods. We are warned that this is a different tour in that in the previous chapters, chapters 14 through chapter 21, when he is addressing the the nations, it begins with a prophecy to and names the nation. Babylon, 
Egypt, Cush, Syria, Damascus. Here what we have is in chapter 21 through 23, he doesn't address them by name. Some of them he addressed by a character element or a location. For example, the prophecy beginning Isaiah 21 is directed to the desert by the sea. Now, if you weren't, if if you weren't uh, aware of cultural things, if you weren't aware of some geographical issues that feed that title, you wouldn't know other than the heading that is extra biblical in your Bibles that he was talking about Babylon. And actually, it's not. It's not so much talking about Babylon. It's talking about Chaldea, which was part of the Babylonian Empire that was right off of the, it was the, uh, the delta region of the Euphrates, where the Euphrates would pour into the Persian Gulf. What is the difference in the two tours? The first one is about values and trust. This tour is about character and image. We have the opportunity to see the city behind the city, to look into the corners of the neighborhoods and see what the impressions that each of the cities leaves of themselves. What is that, why does that matter? How, I mean, what, what difference does it make the character of a nation? How does a person's character play into the role the, in, into how is it instrumental in what that person is and what that person will become? Can you think of someone that you could pretty much say, here's where this person's going to end up because of the character that they exhibit? I, we had a, a, a young man in the neighborhood he was part of the church, a member of the church for a number of years. He grew up here. He lived a block away from us. And in high school, he began to get involved in drug use. And as I watched him, I noticed things getting worse and worse. One day I was out in the front yard raking the yard, and he came by, and you could just tell by the, the sway in his walk the look on his face that he was deeply under the influence of something. And he knew this isn't heading somewhere good. You know, Lara and I had been involved in this young man's life. We'd, he'd been in our home many times. We tried to intervene at this point, but things just kept on going. Finally, the drug use became so bad that one evening, in a fit of rage, he killed his mother. 27 stab wounds. Character does tell you something about someone. Only by the grace of God does, character, d does the destiny that we are living out in our character not become the reality because God changes our character from within. That's why the story of these nations is important, because their character had established their destiny. It determined what they were going to become unless God intervened. If it's true of the individuals, it's true of the nations. Finally, Isaiah shares where the particular character of the city is leading. If it doesn't change, some destinies are dark. Others are, have a glimmer of hope. Sometimes it's a good indicator of where the individuals or nations will end. The same is true of these prophecies. We begin our journey with the starting point back in Isaiah 13 14. And here, Babylon is our target. A culture of hedonism will be defeated. 
Now, in just, just to help us today to get a point of reference on this tour, we're going to be looking at some maps um, here. And so what I want you to see is, is Babylon here. Uh, Babylon, the, the, um, the Delta region, again, down at the Persian Gulf, that's Chaldea. That's the desert by the sea. Nebuchadnezzar was the, the king of Babylon was actually a Chaldean and he they provided the military might of the Babylonian Empire. Babylon um, it, the what it tells us here is in Isaiah chapter twenty one verse five it says they they sat they set the tables, they spread the rugs, they ate, and they drank. Now, again, that seems kind of an innocuous statement, except when those things, when, when that occurs, the eating and drinking occurs throughout Scripture, unless it's given in a certain context, it's, it, means, it means to express that they were indulgent. It's the same kind of thing that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, or 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where he says eat drink and today for tomorrow we die it's the very same thing he's actually going that, that quote is actually going to come from Isaiah 22 it's just a life that says party on um, Babylon was proud of its influence through the culture of self indulgence pleasure seeking it was their greatest export to the world. By the time the New Testament comes, the name Babylon had become synonymous with hedonistic pursuit of pleasure. Her culture of seduction was very real. As we get to the book of Revelation, the, the issue of Babylon there is not talking about Babylon, but that but name Babylon is taken for Rome and her seductive influence. If Rome could seduce you into sin, into idolatry, the all the better, but if they couldn't seduce you, they would oppress you. Babylon was a seductress. Which is why in Revelation 18, she's described or in Revelation 17, she's described as the harlot. Just get people to worship what pleases them. Just get them to live in such a way that they fill all of the darkest desires, that all of those things become acceptable. Sound like any place you know? Sounds to me a lot like Hollywood. Through movies and television, programming systematically, reprogramming, cultural values and norms. An example of that might be the arrival of soap on TV in 1977. Many of you won't recall soap because you weren't old enough to watch TV or old enough to be born yet, but soap was the first TV show with, open, with an openly gay character on prime time. As time passed, 2003 arrives, Ellen DeGeneres' show begins with a gay host. In 2003, as the show began, she kind of played her lesbianism low-key, but as the, sh as the show continued on, she became more and more... Um, dominant in promoting her pride of her lesbianism. Today it seems like every television show has a mandate that at least there at least needs to be one gay couple on the show. Over time, not all at once, 
desensitize people let them get used to it let them make let them begin to feel comfortable with it let them begin to accept it as okay and we've done just that over and over again TV introduces us to things that we begin to say you know it's not so bad after all I can indulge some I can do that it's okay it's just after all we love one another It's when, our, it's when we begin to say that our pleasure is more important than our holiness. In some ways, so many ways, Hollywood would serve as a fine representation. Hedonism is self-gratifying pursuit of pleasure. The hedonistic pursuit of pleasure leads us to anything goes. If it feels good, do it. Philosophy for life. Ronald Blue said conflict comes out of inner sensual lusts of ple or pleasures. Hedonism, the playboy philosophy that makes pleasure mankind's chief end, still wages war in people's hearts. Where does that end, uh, end with? In verses 8 and 9 of chapter 21, Isaiah says, And the lookout shouted day after day, My Lord, I stand in the watchtower. Every night I stand at my post. There, Lord, look, here comes a man in a chariot with a team of horses. And he goes back to answer, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. All of the images of its gods lie shattered on the ground. This is echoed in Revelation again in Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 through 3 where it says after this I saw another angel coming down from heaven he had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor with a mighty voice he shouted fallen fallen is Babylon the great she has become a dwelling of demons and a haunt for every impure spirit a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all of the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Pleasure as your God does not last long. I've dealt with a number of men who've been to my office because of issues with pornography. And they've been caught. Oh, the viewing was exciting. But when they got caught, all of the excitement that they experienced over the days or weeks or months that they had participated in that sin, that viewing, was all of a sudden not worth it. I've known other couples that have been involved in affairs, one night stands, just one moment in weakness that they said yes to another person, and it ended up shattering their marriage relationship. I know of people that have said, you know, I'm not going to, I can fudge my taxes just this much, just this little bit. No one's ever going to know. The IRS is never going to audit me. I'm going to be just fine. And they end up getting a large tax bill from the government saying, you owe us. And their financial picture grows even worse. That love of pleasure, that desire to have the things that thrill me have made many families come to a place of financial insolvency. I need the bigger TV. I need this. I, I, you know, the, the third, it was, it, when, when we got married, it was the 13 inch. I mean, that's all Larry and I had. All, all we could afford was this little 13 inch black and white that we had in our apartment. And 
as we've you know as we've been married throughout the years we've graduated we went from the 13 to the 19 to the 24 to the 27 to the 32 and we've made it up to the 44 or I've got I've got a 44 in my little room Lara's got a 50 inch in the living room Ironically, they cost about the same as the 13-inch <laughs> when I was a kid. But, you know, we always need bigger. We always need better. We always need to improve. And as we keep chasing that imaginary goal, thinking that this new thing is going to give us more pleasure, more excitement, more it's going to fulfill a greater need within us, it ends up robbing us more and more. One person said, the crazy thing about wa the water of the world is that it only makes you thirsty. If you drink, drink from the wells of materialism or hedonism, you'll have to return because you'll only want more. Do you know anyone's life who has been destroyed by pleasure-seeking? Someone that was living a life is saying, it's all just about enjoying myself. As long as I'm enjoying myself, I'm fine. And all of a sudden, it all caves in. That opening scene with Babylon sets the stage for the next couple as well. Because news of Babylon begins to travel through the trade routes and the first place that it's going to go as it travels east through the trade route is a, an oasis village called Duma. And in Duma, it's a culture of reliance that will be devastated. Duma, again the small oasis town on the trade route west of Babylon, trading caravans would stop there for their refreshment on their way west from the rich resources of Babylon that they were carting off into other regions or either going into ba towards Babylon. They would stop there to refresh their water, take some time to rest and recuperate. And it would be this gathering spot of sharing the news with one another what's going on. And it's out of that that we hear the verses that are here. Duma was, was a vital military and economic role in relationship with Mesopotamia and Edom. It carried that linkage between them and its fate greatly affected those around them. Isaiah chapter 21 verses 11 through 12 says a prophecy against Duma. Someone calls to me from Seir, Watchman, what is left of the night? Watchman, what is left of the night? The watchman replies, Morning is coming, but also the night. If you would ask, I have, then, then ask and come back and yet again. Now, that may be as confusing to you as it was to me initially. <laughs> What's it talking about? Well, it's talking about a traveler coming into Duma and having that conversation with somebody who is coming from the opposite direction. They're coming from Seir in Edom and they're meeting to, and the one is coming from Babylon and they're meeting together at Duma and they're sharing what's going on. What's the news? And the, 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 the one coming from Babylonia is coming. Night's coming. It's getting dark. Doom is on its way. It may look like things are right, okay right now, but the darkness is quickly approaching. been there? You see, what the issue there is, is Duma, because it was on that trade route, what happened to Babylon was going to happen to Duma. I've heard many times that what, ha what begins in California eventually gets to the rest of the United States. 
or what happens in Washington D.C. or in Wall Street happen gets eventually gets to the United States or gets to the rest of the United States, even those little cornfields in Nebraska and Kansas. Those that are reliant on somewhere else, they're going to be affected by it. The downfall of those other places is going to suddenly seep in and affect them as well. What are you relying upon? What do you lean into? Who, who do you rely on? Who do you lean into? If that person, if that one that you lean into falls, what's going to happen to you? Now, Benjamin's beginning to, to understand that if I lean too heavily on grandma and grandpa, they're going to fall down, and when they fall down, I'm going to fall down too. It's taken him a while because he used to come up and, gra and grab a hold of the leg and you try to walk with the leg. And, you know, my, the, the weakness that I have in the legs would be like, oh, man. <laughs> Who are you going to rely on? Those that you rely on, if they aren't divine are going to let you down at some point in time. Just ask a married couple. I mean, the reality is, at some point in time with every married couple, you arrive at a point in time where you actually ask yourself, who is this that I married? Has the devil come and, and taken over this person? Is it, it, this isn't the person I married. Because you've come to a place of relying in that relationship and thinking, I know who this person is. I know what they're like. And when they act in a way that leaves me dangling, I wonder, where does that leave me? Duma is left dangling. Babylon has fallen. The ones that we've placed our trust in, the ones we have been reliant on, have failed. And now we're next. He moves on down the road from, from Duma to a, can, a, a caravan, a, a region in, in, out in Arabia where the culture of decline will not recover. Kedar was a small kingdom in the east of the Gulf of the Aqaba and the Arabian Sea in the Arabian Desert. The kingdom was made up of a confederation of nomadic shepherd tribes, and Kedar means dark, and so there, there are those that have said, well, it means that the Kedar, Kedarites were dark-skinned, or it may simply mean, it may simply be in reference to the black tents that they lived in, made from black goat hair, to keep the heat of the Arabian sun in the desert from them. In verses 13 through 17, it says, A prophecy against Arabia, your, your caravan of Dedanites, who walk in the thickets of Arabia, bring water for the thirsty. You who live in Tima, bring food for the fugitives. They flee from the sword, from the drawn sword, from the bent arrow, and from the heat of battle. This is what the Lord says to you. Within one year, as a servant bound by contract would count it, all the splendor of Kedar will come to an end. The survivors of the archers, the warriors of Kedar, will be few. The Lord, the God of Israel, has spoken. Who are these Kedarites? Well, they're mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, in the Koran. Kedar was Ishmael's second son. Now, Ishmael was Abraham's first son by Hagar 
and they went into exile and within Islamic tradition some scholars claim that the Islamic prophet Muhammad was descended from Ishmael through Qadar. Now following the trade route is obvious as a member is it mentions of Didan another oasis community in the Arabian Peninsula that was the center of trade for the western part of Arabia and trading on into the Negev where we would say the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula the 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 Kedarite Confederation reached its apex in the 7th century about 712 BC in the, right in the time frame of Isaiah but they began a quick decline that was a probable link to the be that and there's probably a, a link to the Bedouin tribes that still inhabit Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the Negev. What's going on here? The words keeps going. Babylon has fallen. By the time it gets to Kedar, it's your next. You're going to fall as well. It's not going to be long before Assyria is there and Assyria brings destruction. Oh, the, the, the fall has begun to happen. It says, a boulder begins to roll downhill. As long as that boulder is established and firm and unmoving, it can be hard to get rolling. But once you get that bowler mo 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 moving downhill, it's hard to make it stop. And if perchance you are able at all to bring a halt to its progression downhill, it's impossible to roll it back up. That's the ma uh, that, that, that would apply to this setting. Arabia, Qadar, your, things have begun to decline. Things have begun to move in the wrong direction. And they will keep on going that way. You think things are bad now? Just wait. They're going to continue to get worse. Some of you have been there. Where? You thought... Okay. It's bad. It couldn't get any worse. And you wake up the next morning and you get a phone call and find out I didn't have any idea how bad it could be. That's the direction. You see, some of us are living in a place of perpetual decline where we look backwards and we say the best is in the be the best is behind us the, the 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 good life is over uh, now it's all rolling downhill I'm I'm on I uh, you know we talk about the, that in terms of age you know we're on the downward uh, we're on the downward slide let, let me tell you this they they they've done actually a study in in productivity human productivity and what they have found that the most productive years of a person's life are in their 60s. That's when you are at maximum capacity. Anybody want to take a guess at your second most productive years of your lives? No. Your 70s. Third is your 50s. Okay? Now, where we have begun to think it's all downhill, it's, it, it, it's nowhere, you know, it, you know, and I think part of what's fed for us is, is the issue of retirement. But we go and we retire, 
at those years that we could be the most productive. Why is it the most productive? Because the children have grown, they've gone away. We now can dedicate ourselves to our jobs in certain ways that we couldn't before because now we have the freedom to do things. We can spend extra time or we can actually go and spend time with our spouses. We can do other things and we can enjoy life more because some of the demands that we had when we were younger that dissolved our effectiveness are already gone. But we live in that place where we think it's only going downhill. Where it's only going to get worse. When you live with that kind of mindset, God says, yeah, you're right. If you think it's only going to get worse, guess what? It is only going to get worse. Things will not get better. In chapter 22, he begins to talk to Jerusalem. He gives here uh, Jerusalem an entire chapter. He says, the culture of darkness will not see God at work. Now he, he again talks to Jerusalem here, and he doesn't use the, ter- the term Jerusalem. He uses a ironic term, the Valley of Vision. It's going to be ironic because of where it's going to go with this. They assume that we have this tremendous vision. We have figured these things out. We know where we're going. We figured this out. We figured it out without God. God's out of the picture. God's not involved. We took care of ourselves. Jerusalem is the capital of the Judah, Judahites or Jewish state, and this is all that remains of the vast empire of the 10th century B.C., God's people had been whittled down to this last little refuge. Now, Isaiah brings a warning to them. The prophecy against Jerusalem begins with an exodus of its leaders from Jerusalem. God's bringing judgment upon Jerusalem for their sinfulness and it's every man for themselves. The leaders are the first to evacuate. In verses 9 through 11 it says, You saw that the walls of the city of David were broken through in many places. You stored up water in the lower pool. You counted the buildings in Jerusalem and tore down houses to strengthen the walls. You built a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool. Notice who's doing. You did it. But what's missing? But you did not look to the one who made it or have regard to the one who planned it long ago. As God was bringing destruction, Jerusalem was busying themselves with self-reliance. If God is not present, we will take care of ourselves. Sometimes God's at work and we just don't see it. Because what God's doing in our lives isn't what we want done in our lives. So therefore we think, you know, God God can't be in what I don't want. Therefore God's not doing. Here Israel and Judah had lived in lives of sin and lives of adultery and lives of sexual promiscuity and lives of injustice. And they're saying, everything's fine. Oh, the walls fall down. We'll just rebuild it. We'll make it better than it was. We'll be okay. We're doing all right. But they have forgotten that they have left God out of the picture. They don't see that it's actually God who's bringing about judgment. And he's bringing about judgment in order to bring about redemption. 
because they won't reconnect with God on their own, the only recourse that God has is saying, all right, I'll have to turn the heat up. Sometimes we just don't see it. When's the time that you were blind to what God was doing? And you felt like you had to do it yourself? I remember, I've told you, I've told you several times about the split that happened in the church in Minot that I was there and how we, um, we were specifically targeted in that. Um, after the meeting where I was called Satan in our midst, I spent the next week in my office crying. I was like, God, where are you? God, what have you done to me? What, what, why am I such a failure? I didn't see what God was doing. There's other times where in my life I can look back and say, God, where have you been? Right now, over the last few years, it's been that point in time as we've been trying to journey through a transition here and thinking, you know, God, okay, we, we're going to have to sell the building. Well, no, there's no buyers. Two years now, and the, the, no buyers cropped up. God, what are you doing? What are you doing? And when you're not able to see what God's doing, sometimes you begin to think, well, we've got to solve this on our own. We've got to do, we've got to do our thing. We've got to get to work. We've got to make this happen. We've got to serve harder, work harder, do things, and it's all about us. And we forget to see that God's doing His work in ways that we may not understand. Have you been there? In verses 12 and 13, he says, The Lord, the Lord Almighty, called on you, called on that day to weep and to wail, to tear out your hair and put on sackcloth. But there is joy and revelry, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. That's the quote that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15. When you don't acknowledge God's presence in the activities of your lives, you don't respond with repentance, and your inclination is towards the same kind of hedonism represented in Babylon. He's calling them to repent, to look inside, say, where have I failed God? To turn a corner here, and God says you are continuing to go down. In verse 14, he says, The Lord Almighty has revealed this in my hearing. Till your dying day, this sin will not be atoned for, says the Lord, the Lord Almighty. And then he goes through and he tells of two particular people. One is Shebna. Shebna is the king's administrator. Something like a, the secretary of state for us. And Shebna... As this attack is fomenting, the, the threat from Assyria is building, has already arrived at a point where so God's already written us off. I'm going to spend my time building my burial chamber. I've given up hope. And God tells Shebna, you're never going to use that. I'm going to take you from your position of power. I'm going to replace you with, with uh, another. And you're going to be taken off into exile. When we become blind to what God is doing, it leaves us in the dark. It leaves us without hope. It leaves us in despair. The last place on our tour is a town named Tyre. 
Tyre is actually an island that uh, is off the coast of, it's part of the nation of Phoenicia, it's off the coast about 300 yards from, from uh, land. Um, the twin city with it is the, is the city Sidon. Jesus once visited there, and it, and it what what it was was it was this protected port island because the mountains of Phoenicia would dr- dramatically dropped into the ocean, and so in order to try to invade Tyre from land was nearly impossible, and that they had well fortified themselves against any attack from sea. It had become a major port city of the in, in, during the eighth century, and it had become developed a shipping industry that that lasted for nearly four centuries, dominated for nearly four centuries. Map had uh, another map here is Tyre had had the shipping network that they had bought that they traveled so far reached from one end of the Mediterranean Sea to the other end of the Mediterranean Sea to today's Spain to Tarshish now for some of you Tarshish will ring a note of remembrance you've heard that name before that's where Jonah was heading when God told him to go to Nineveh I mean he's taking a trip there Bring, bring that slide back up. Okay. Tarshish is the spot farthest on the left. Okay. Now Tyre is the Tyre is the the spot there, and that's that's an appro- that's pretty close to where where Jonah was when he was called. But. The issue here is rather than heading to Nineveh, which is the spot on the right, he heads left. I think Jonah was one of those one of those husbands that the wives would say, "You need to stop and ask for directions." He definitely made a wrong turn somewhere. Tyre regarded itself as all-powerful, superhuman, virtually eternal. She was possessed of wealth and wisdom above all of the other cities, and this led to an incredible arrogance for which Tyre was notorious. In chapter 23, verses 15 and 16, it says this, At that time... Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, the span of a king's life. But at the end of those 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the prostitute. Take up a harp, walk through the city, you forgotten prostitute. Play the harp well, sing many a song so that you will be remembered. The prostitution of Tyre is not what we would normally imagine with that term. What's being referred to is not a night of seducing men into sex, but Tyre had prostituted itself in trade and prosperity. It allowed wealth to seduce. They They had gone to bed with the God of money. Wealth and prosperity flowed in abundance. Ezekiel really describes Tyre this way. Tyre that had kidnapped entire communities and sold the people to Edom as slaves. The Warren Wiersbe puts it this way. Tyre was selling its friends as slaves. Imagine selling off your friends to make a buck. Tyre's crime was even more reprehensible because it involved breaking treaties that they had established with others. Tyre had completely bought into prosperity and protection as the principles for livelihood. How difficult is it to change then when you, when you buy in to placing your trust in those places? 
Tyre was not conquered until Alexander the Great in 332 BC. When Alexander engineered a devastating siege by building a land bridge that 300 yards out into the ocean or out into the sea. During the third century, Alexander had created Alexandria, and Alexandria ultimately became uh, brought about the decline of Tyre's industry by replacing them as the major shipping port in the Western Empire, or Eastern Empire. And that's recalled or reflected again in Revelation 18, verse 15, where it says, the, surf, the merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her stood far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn. Oh, all of the economic engines that we had placed our trust in, all of the hope that we had placed our trust in has collapsed on us. We... We've lost our power and our influence. But in verses 17 and 18 of Isaiah 23, it says, At the end of 70 years, the Lord will deal with Tyre. She will return to her lucrative prostitution and will ply her trade with all of the kingdoms on the face of the earth. What? I mean, that's confusing, isn't it? God sends them, God, God's going to bring about defeat. He's going to bring, send you through 70 years of nothingness, and you're going to come out of that 70 years of this, and you're going to re-engage in the prostitution that you were engaged in before. Now, here's where, here's where this is an unfortunate translation. Because rather than, translation, rather than translating it prostitution, it would be plying their trade. That that they're going to come back after that seventy years, and they're going to reinvent themselves in their trading industry. But this time, there's going to be a difference. Yet her profit and her earnings will be set apart for the Lord. They'll be they will not be stored up or hoarded. Her prophets will go to those who live before the Lord for abundant food and fine clothes. A culture of prostitution is redeemed. Derek Kidner in the New Bible Commentary says, as a fact of history, after each disaster until the Middle, middle Ages, Tyre recovered after an, in, after an interval and resumed her trading. Interestingly, 70 years is the same period of time that Judah will be in Babylonian exile. It seems that 70 years is to be understood as a proper period of national consequence that brings about repentance and renewal. In Psalm 87, that salvation will be it says that salvation will be extended to Tyre. Here, a country given to wealth and prosperity can become a country whose character is a country of saying, "We're giving to God." You see. There are times when character can change, where things can be different. Tyre is that example. Where someone goes when God's grace is felt within their lives, when it comes to a place of repentance, things can change. What are these tours? The two tours that we've taken over the last couple of weeks teach us at least two things. At least cause us to ans ask two questions. Why would you trust the nations? 
if the nations can't be trusted because they're the things that they place them trust are going to all fall apart and they will end up not having anything or that their character is devoid of anything solvent that will keep them together why trust in them to which we need to ask why trust the United States It's okay to be patriotic, but when you come to a place of idolatry with your nation, you've come to a place too far. Our nation, our politics, our parties cannot be trusted. Why would we do it? You'd think that as often as we've been lied to by politicians and parties that we would get the hint, but can we continue to cast our vote for those very same people who lie to us? Not only should we ask the question, why would we trust the nations? We should ask the question, would it be, <laughs> wouldn't it be better to trust in Yahweh? Yahweh's faithful. Unlike the nations who will switch and sway with the feel of whatever conserves them, whatever is convenient for them, God is always faithful. God is consistent. How, how would you characterize your current spiritual condition? If God were to write you and to say, okay, I want to tell you about your character. I want to tell you about the impression, the image that you present to the world around you. What would that read? And what would you need to do to improve that impression? What life changes would you need to go through? What decisions would you... How would repentance need to happen in order for you to become what God says? This is what I envision you as. Tyre had to go through 70 years of exile, 70 years of decline, but they came out again. Whatever you're going through, wherever you're being tested, however you think that things just are getting worse and worse and there's no hope of it, God may be taking you through what you need to go through in order to make the changes that you need to make to become the person that he wants you to become. So let's learn the lesson. Let's learn where we have tossed God aside and we are living a life apart from him. Next week we take a new, we, we take another tour. But this one's not going to be confined to the globe. God's no longer being a, be God God next week doesn't say I'm the king of the nations any longer. God's declaration for us next week is I'm king of the universe. Nations are too small. I control the entire universe. And if I control the entire universe, I am king of you. Let's pray together. God, we come to you this morning recognizing again your kingship of the nations, that you are right in your judgment, but you were also right in your grace. God, help us to live lives of character that are character, lives of honor, lives that you can take pride in, lives that you 
can say are worthy of being called yours. God grant us that grace so we don't have to face the consequences of living outside of your grace. God, we thank you for your abundant mercy. Where necessary, apply your judgment to bring us to redemption. Help us to see your hand at work so we can give you the honor that's due. In your son's name we pray. There's one God that I serve, maker of heaven and the earth. Formed by the power of his word, oh, I will forever lift thy name. Yahweh, the only one who's holy, worthy of our praise. You deserve the honor, the glory, say. No God greater, no one greater than Yahweh, Yahweh. The only one who's holy, who's worthy of our praise. You deserve the honor, the glory, so we say. There's no God greater, no one greater than Yahweh. Oh, no one like our God, no one like our God. Now you say it. Oh, oh. No one like our God, no one like our God. Say that again. Oh, 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 no one like our God, no one like our God. Oh, no. No one like our God, Yahweh, Yahweh, the only one who's holy and worthy of our praise. You deserve the honor, the glory, so we say there's no God greater no one greater than Yahweh and again Yahweh the only one who's holy and worthy of our praise you deserve the glory the honor so we say there's no God greater no one greater than Yahweh. We say there's no God greater, no one greater than Yahweh. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. Help us to honor you as the only and true God. In Jesus' name, everyone says, amen. I do have suggestions for no arrival needs, so you can see me on this side, Pastor Steve.
I just want to take a moment to re-emphasize one of the announcements that Jeff made earlier um, uh, concerning the sound equipment. Um, what we are doing with that is uh, Pentecost is coming. Um, Pentecost, when God sent his Holy Spirit upon the church and created, essentially created um, the church, as what we're going to do is we're going to be taking that offering for the sound equipment as a Pentecost offering. Um, in recognition of God's Holy Spirit work, that uh, taking that offering for us to give to the sound equipment so we can celebrate and honor and worship Him with fuller voices and fuller hearts, and we can work out some of that. And so on Sunday, I think it's May 21st or May 19th, Anybody got a calendar? Um, what, whichever one, I think it's the 19th, um, that we, we will be on that Sunday taking that offering. And so we have roughly a month to prepare to set aside um, some additional funds. Now, that is additional funds. That's not taking some of your regular donation and redirecting it, um, but to say, Here's where I want to give something be above and beyond what I would normally give in order to support um, that purchase that we have. Now, let me let me clarify something that um, my wife asked um, when, when, I, when we were talking about that, or when she read that in the messenger or the newsletter. She asked, why are we going to spend money on that when, we, when the building's up for sale and we might be leaving the building? Those things would be going with us. What we would be purchasing would be equipment that is not tied to the building. It would transition to with us wherever we end up relocating if we do. Otherwise, we'll use it here. Okay? And uh, so I wanted you to understand that as well. Um, that this is not something that's, again, a, a dead end of of resources, but this is something that will help us transition as well. Um, well again, what the, the issue that we have is, again, these mics um, are susceptible to interference. If you guys have your phones on on Sunday morning and your phone operates on 5G and you get a text message, you can interfere with the reception of these microphones, okay? That's what we're talking about. That the the frequency that these microphones operate on has been sold by the FCC for 5G purposes. Policeman drives by and on his radio, we're gonna drop. Okay? So that's that's the issue that we're dealing with with these mics. And so I just wanted to, to mention that, thinking, well, we got we got mics already. Why would we be investing in more? Because we're investing in mics that have a broader spectrum of range so that next time the FCC decides that they're going to sell frequencies, we don't have to buy new mics then. This is actually, this is the third time, or second, second or third time that we've had to do this. Okay? So we just want to prepare so that next time it happens, set with equipment that doesn't that is not inadequate and becomes quickly obsolete. Every three to four years the FCC sells off frequencies. Okay? So let, I wanted to let you know that. God, let me pray for you and then uh, dismiss. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In his son's name.